I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. Now, I have not in any way ever said that God ha has commanded or could command genocide. That's an unsympathetic misrepresentation of what I said. What I was dealing with are these narratives in the Hebrew Bible concerning God's commands to Israel to go into the land of Canaan or the modern day land of Palestine and to drive out the Canaanite clans or tribes that were inhabiting the land. And in the Hebrew Bible, God commands Israelites to go in there and to slaughter uh, any of the Canaanites that uh, oppose them, whether man, woman, or child, they are to be exterminated. Now, anybody who takes the Bible to be historical has got to wrestle with these difficult texts. The, the question is, how could a God who is all loving, all good, and all holy, issue such commands. Um, and why would he do so? How, is there some kind of internal inconsistency here? And what I argued was that when you look into these in the context of the narrative, you find that God held his people Israel in Egypt for 400 years before bringing them into the land of Canaan because he said the iniquity of the Canaanites is not yet complete. These people were not yet so debauched, so reprobate that God would judge them. And so he held his people in abeyance until the iniquity of these Canaanite tribes was so pronounced, so they were so vile and so evil that God finally used Israel as his means of bringing judgment upon these tribes in the same way that God would later use pagan nations like Babylon and Assyria to judge his own people, Israel, by allowing them to come in and sweep through the land and conquer the people. So that this represented God's judgment upon the, these uh, Canaanite tribes. And when you read the ancient non-biblical literature about these tribes, this was a culture that was incredibly evil. Clay Jones has written a, an article on this in Philosophia Christi in which he looks at some of these ancient texts. And the sort of the, the bestiality and uh, human sacrifice and the mockery of, of God that characterized this culture was really, really vile. And, and it, it raises the hair on your neck to read these texts of what these people were like. And it, this story of the conquest of Canaan only comes after the story of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And you may remember in that story, Abraham argues with God and says, God, if there are 50 righteous people in these cities, will you, will you destroy them? Will you destroy the good along with the unjust? And God says, no, for the sake of the 50, I will not destroy them. And then like a Middle Eastern merchant, uh, Abraham bargains with God. Well, God, if there are 40 in the city, will you destroy it? God says, no, for the sake of the 40 righteous people, I will not destroy it. And God says, uh, Abraham says, oh, God, don't be impatient with me. But if there are 10 righteous men in the city, will you destroy it? And God says, no, for the sake of the 10, I will not destroy it. And Abraham doesn't dare to argue any further with God. But the purpose of this story, which comes in the narrative prior to the conquest of Canaan, I think, is to emphasize that God is not going to judge these people until they are utterly, utterly deserving of judgment uh, because they are so debauched. So um, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is, is illustrative of why God held his people for 400 years before bringing them into the land. And when he brought them into the land to judge Canaan, what was that judgment? It was not to commit genocide. That is an utter misrepresentation. There was no racial war here. There was no command to pursue and hunt down the Canaanites and exterminate them all. What was the command? The command was to drive them out of the land. The land is what is 
was and remains so all important to these Middle Eastern people. Who has the land? And what God was doing was destroying these Canaanite uh, petty kingdoms as nation states. He was destroying these nation states in effect by dispossessing of the, them of their land and bringing in the Israelites and giving the land over to Israel as the land of Israel, the promised land. And if these Canaanite tribes had simply fled before the advancing armies of Israel, no one would have been killed. There was no command to hunt down the Canaanites, no intention to kill them all off and eliminate them. It was only those who stayed behind to fight that would be killed. Uh, and in fact, there is nothing in the narrative to suggest that any women or children were killed. There is no narrative whatsoever that says that anybody other than combatants were killed in this cleansing of the land. And we really don't know how many actually were killed. This was apparently a gradual sort of dispossessing of the land that these tribes occupied. So the question is then, well, how could a god who is all holy and just and loving command such a thing? And I think you can make sense of this through a divine command morality, which says that our moral duties are constituted by God's commands so that when he issues commands to us, these become our moral duties. So Israel and the armies of Israel became, in effect, the instrument by which God judged these Canaanite peoples. The adults deserved the judgment that they, they received if they stayed behind. Now, the more difficult problem is the children. How could God command that the children be killed because these are innocent? And I think what I would want to say there is that God has the right to give and take life as he sees fit. Children die all the time, every day. Uh, people's lives are cut short. God is under no obligation whatsoever to prolong anyone's life another second. So he has the right to give and take life as he chooses. Moreover, if you believe as I do in the salvation of infants or children who die, what that meant was that these the, the death of these children meant their salvation. They were the recipients of an infinite good as a result of their earthly phase of life being terminated. The problem is that people look at this from a naturalistic perspective and think life ends at the grave. But in fact, this was the salvation of these children and would be far better for them than continuing to be raised, say, in this reprobate uh, Canaanite culture. So I don't think God wronged anybody in commanding this to be done. He didn't wrong the adults because they were deserving of capital punishment. He didn't wrong the children if there were any that were killed, which we don't know, because God has the right to take their lives. And he, in fact, uh, in fact, they were the recipients of a great good. So I don't think there was anybody that was morally wronged in this affair. So it seems to me that it is possible for God to do so. I think only one thing needs to be added, and that is that God had morally sufficient reasons for issuing such an extraordinary command. It, it needs to be understood as how extraordinary and out of the ordinary this, this command was. It is associated with the conquest of, of Canaan and the dispossession of the land and giving it to these people. And God, I think, had morally sufficient reasons for doing this because um, these people were due for judgment and by issuing so harsh an object lesson to Israel, by using them as his instruments for bringing judgment in this way, he emphasized to them, as nothing else could do, how they were to be a holy people set apart for God himself and not to follow after the pagan deities of Israel's neighbors, not to betray uh, their faith and, and apostatize and follow these Canaanite gods like Baal and, and Molech and others. This was an, uh, an object lesson to them to preserve Israel and, their, and, and the salvation of these people, through which, of course, the instrumentality of Israel, he would eventually bring the Christ into the world and effect the salvation of the entire world through Christ. So I think God had morally sufficient reasons for doing such an extraordinary uh, thing, uh, which is really unique and uh, not something to be repeated or expected in any other time or age.